Well, man, it's so good to see all of you here today. Before I do anything else, I want to look into the camera and say a big hello to all of those that are joining us online today. Come on, Heartland family, help me welcome them to church. And uh, that first video, man, just moved me so much just to see an outpouring of God's spirit in so many people's lives. And uh, look, you know, those are intense times where you're searching after the heart of God. How many people are a little bit tired? You know, it's kind of normal, you know, as you're searching after God like that with that kind of intensity. But I'm just so proud of you and the way that you showed up and uh, just really excited as we move into the fall. And uh, a couple of things I I just want to say right off the top, you did hear Um, Chase, talk a little bit about the Welcome to Church Party, and that's happening tonight at 6 o'clock, and uh, I'm really excited. If you are brand new to our church, kind of trying to find your place, uh, find where you fit in, want to learn a little bit more about us, and we want to learn some things about you, there's a QR code they're putting up on the screen right now, and uh, tonight will be our biggest Welcome to Church Party we've ever had. Over 100 of you are registered uh, to come and hang out with us, and I'm really excited about that. God continues to grow our church right now, and uh, so come, come hang out. Come meet a whole bunch of new people. Uh, we would love for you to be here. We'll transform this room, and uh, it'll be a lot of fun, and uh, we'll try to have you out at a timely manner. And I'll just share with you a little bit about our church and the vision and where we're, where we're running. And, and I think it'll be a great night. But we want to make sure that we have enough food. So uh, really important that you register. And then uh, our small group fall semester starts the week of September 8th. Now, they're putting up a QR code on the screen. And I, I'm, I'm going to say this a lot over the next couple of weeks. That it's so important that you find community outside of just a Sunday experience. You know, almost every day, and I really mean this, almost every day when I wake up, I feel like God puts somebody on my mind uh, in our church. Like, I haven't seen that person in a minute. You know, are they okay? Is, is their life good? You know, and I'm, I feel like I'm waking up and texting our pastors or texting somebody in our church. I'm constantly thinking about people, but if I can just be honest with you, we, we had right under 1,000 people here this past weekend at our church There's no way that I'm going to be able to know everyone. Uh, There's no way that our pastoral team is going to be able to know everyone. You know, and there's no way that I can look out on a Sunday and in my mind as I'm standing up here right now think, where are they? Are they here? Are they here? Are they, you know, it's impossible for me. It's impossible for our team to know. You could even go almost three weekends, four weekends, six weekends. But it's like, does anybody know I don't exist on that team? We, we know you exist, we love you, we just, we don't always see you. And by the time we miss you, sometimes you're not here. And that's why being a part of a group is so important. Because I may not know, but let me tell you, if you're not here, somebody in your group would know. And that's the power of community, that we love one another, we, we get in groups, and we understand that we're bigger than just one pastor caring for us. It's people Caring for people, loving people, living in relationship with other people. I mean, that's really the point. And so, a couple of things. Number one, I, I really want you to consider next week. We'll start signing people up for groups next week and the week after uh, on September 8th. But maybe you've kind of thought about leading a group. There's three different types of groups that we have here in our church there's growth groups, which are discipleship oriented, there's freedom groups which are really the very first step that I want many of you to take if you've never been to a group. It's, a, it's an 11-week Bible study that I'd love for you to check, check out. Uh, just about finding freedom from your old life uh, outside of God into the new life that God's created you with. And the, but the third kind of group is just social groups. Like they're not, They require no spirituality whatsoever. It's just you hanging out and getting to know people because there are people in this church that they're just saying to themselves, I, I really don't even care so much about Like, I just, can somebody be my friend? (laughs) You know what I mean? Can I have friends within the church? I know you have friends outside the church, but I need to meet people in my church. And that's what social groups are all about. So if if you're considering, like, leading a group, I mean, the qualifications for some of these are so easy. It's just you got to have a willingness to do something fun and for other people to hang out with you. And so check these out today. After both services, we're doing uh, trainings. And uh, I would love for you to get involved in a group this semester and uh, let's, let's make sure that somebody always knows our name. Amen, everybody? That, that as a church grows, uh, the way it has to stay is small at the same time. And the way it stays small is through groups. And so I'm really excited uh, about the semester coming up. All right. 
Are you ready to jump back into the book of Acts today, everybody? We started this, The Power That I Need. I, I felt like God spoke to me in August of last year uh, and told me that this was going to be a year of power for our church. And man, wasn't this past week a week of power in our church. I mean, it was amazing. God has really been working. And, um, and when I asked the Holy Spirit, like, what do you feel like that means, the year of power? I don't understand. I just felt like the Lord told me to lead our church through the book of Acts this year. And so that's what we started the year doing. We, this is the 16th week uh, of the book of Acts that I'm going to do today. We took a break over the summer. Uh, but the elephant in the room is well, we ain't finishing this year. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, I said we'd do the book of Acts in 2024, and we're, we're barely going to make it out of Acts chapter 10. Uh, so we're going to go all the way up until the last week in, in October. And we'll have a few guest speakers uh, mixed in there. Uh, Pastor Dan's going to speak next weekend, everybody. So get your, get your music ears ready. Um, but let's dive back in today uh, to the book of Acts. I, I was going to go to Acts chapter 9 and just start a brand new chapter. But guys, I cannot skip the second half of Acts chapter 8. It's just too good. It's too rich. And so... I want to go to Acts chapter 8 in your Bibles. If you've got them, whether you got a traditional Bible, you got a glowing Bible, you got a, you're cheating, you forgot yours, so you're using the Bible app on your phone, whatever that looks like today, I want you to get your Bibles. We've, we've, this entire week, and really the last couple of weeks before it, we've, we spend it trying to focus on getting you filled up. You know, it's one of the things that I always want to start August doing, you know, with a renewed focus, renewed passion, renewed energy, answered prayers. And I think on the heels of a week like Seek Week, I always have to circle back around and just simply say this and ask this question. Is we've been praying for all of these things, we're praying for breakthrough, and by the way, we're going to continue to pray like that. The prayer meeting continues this coming Wednesday night. But what we have to ask is what is the more for? I mean, you know, we're praying for blessing, we're praying for breakthrough, we're praying for healing, we're praying for power, we're praying for all the things we prayed for, but if all we ever do is stay focused on ourselves, come on, how many people know we've missed the point? We're being filled up so that we can begin to pour ourselves out. And as we come to the last half of Acts chapter 8, I want to read kind of one of the most famous stories in the book of Acts. And I want to talk about this idea of chasing down chariots. Chasing down chariots. That's the title for today. It's, it's really a message about being others focused. It's about leading and helping others. And for a moment, I want to take you back all the way to the very beginning of Acts, uh, where we started the whole series in Acts chapter 1. I just want to look at kind of a theme verse. We've read it so many times. In Acts chapter 1, it says this, but you will receive, everybody say it with me, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I mean, if there's one verse you're going to know at the end of this year, it's going to be this verse. You know, we've read it so much. And in that first month of January, I, I really taught a lot in that first half of the year about how God wants to give us miraculous power, supernatural power. He wants to give us that power and he wants to do it for a purpose. And that purpose I mean, if you've heard me any time this year, that purpose is to be witnesses. It's not just to have great church. It's not just to get a prayer language. It's to be bold in sharing Christ. And as you become full of the Holy Spirit, let me tell you what should happen in your life. God baptizes you with his spirit. All of a sudden, you'll start talking about Jesus everywhere that you go. You won't be able to help it. It's just who you are. Jesus said in John chapter 20, as the Father has sent me, I have sent you. So I just want to ask you this question today. Who is God sending you to? Who's he sending you to? Who, who has God put on your heart? Who is it right now that you're praying for? Who is it that you're believing God for? Who is it that you're sharing Christ with? Who comes to your mind? And if the answer to that question is, I don't know that anybody comes to my mind, then it's not because there's no one around. <laughs> it's because you're missing the opportunities that are all around you. 
God has called us to be people who, who receive Christ freely and then offer Christ to others. Freely you have received, the Bible says, freely give. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Our job isn't just to wait for people to just kind of maybe one day they have a bad week, they have a bad month, stumble into the church. No, our job is to go out and to tell people about Jesus. And that's what they did in Acts chapter 8. I mean, they'd been persecuted. They'd gone through so much, these, these Jews. And they start, because of the persecution, they start scattering. We looked at this right before the break, that this verse in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, that those who had been scattered, they still preached the word wherever they went. I mean, they've scattered, but they're, they're totally committed to it. And Acts chapter 8 is a story about a man named Philip. We talked about him at the end of May. He's, he's not a disciple. He's not a preacher, although he does begin to preach. He was a lay person that got filled with the Holy Spirit. And as he's scattered, he goes into Samaria and he starts preaching to crowds and people are getting healed and people are getting saved and it's, it's crazy. But in the last part of chapter 8, what we're going to see is that he's no longer preaching to crowds. He's now going directly to people, one-on-one, -on -one, individually. And so I want us to look at this passage today and maybe what we're going to pick up from today is three principles on personal evangelism that we learn from the book of Acts. And I think this is really going to help you. I think this is pretty practical for the most part. I think this is going to help you just in your daily life. Because, listen, sharing your faith is the expectation of believers. And God said that I'm going to send people to you. I'm, I'm going to send you into your workplace. I'm going to send you into your schools. I'm going to send you into your kids' lives. All the things that they're involved with. And it's your job to be this. So... I really hope that you write these things down. I hope that it hits your heart. We're filled up, and so let's do some, some work now that we're being filled up. Let's ask God to help us to pour ourselves out into the lives of others. Amen? Amen. All right, so the first thing I just want you to note today from the book of Acts is this, this idea. And I think it's an interesting concept. It's that evangelism, evangelism in the book of Acts was never limited to church gatherings. In fact, the church gatherings were really secondary. You see, so often we, 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 to see people make decisions and to follow Jesus, we think about it happening in the context of the church. That we're seeking for that to happen. Let's get them in the church and then they'll get saved. And, and I thank God for it. I mean, we do see it. I, we've seen it a lot this year. I thank God that we saw it during Seek Week. I, I thank God that we've seen it prior to Seek Week. Hundreds of people this year. It's really wonderful. But the fact of the matter is this, not everybody who needs Jesus is going to come to this church or for that matter, any other church. Can we just be real? Like most of the people who need Jesus are not coming to church. They're not coming to any church. That's why we have to be willing to go to where they're at. We have to be watching for people who, who don't know Jesus. We have to be watching for people and telling them and, and sharing Christ with them. That, that's what Philip does. And it's actually a tremendous lesson for us to share Christ. And so I hope that you'll watch this really closely. This is Acts chapter 8, verse 26. It says this, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Come on, everybody say this word with me really loud today. Come on, say it. Go. <laughs> he says to Philip, Go. Go south. To the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. I want you to understand that the Lord spoke to Philip and the Lord's going to speak to you too. And I hope that you know that. Some people get afraid by that. Some people are confused by it. But make no mistake, God's speaking to you. God speaks to people. He'll speak to you through his word. He'll speak to you through a prophetic word. He'll speak in that very still, small voice. Sometimes he'll speak to you while you're talking to someone. Some of us, that'll happen. We'll just kind of shake it off. Oh, what is that? I'm going insane. Uh, no, no. God's speaking to you. Our God is a speaking God. In fact, Pastor John Bevere talked about that idea in that Sunday night session that God will share his secrets with us. What great idea. It's powerful. He speaks. And so God is speaking to Philip here. And notice he tells him, he says, go to the desert road. Go south on the desert road. I want to explain that for just a second because when we hear that, we tend to think, when we hear desert, we tend to think of camels and sand and, you know, lizards and skulls and tot and cactus and all that kind of stuff. But anytime, 
in the scripture, you see the word desert. You have to think of like hills and trees and streams. Desert, what desert means in, in, in the uh, New Testament is just there's no, no one there. Now, when we see wilderness, wilderness, we tend to think of trees and thorns and stuff like that. But in the scripture, wilderness means desert. <laughs> so, it's, so it's kind of backwards. So he's on this desert road, okay? It's a, it's a wilderness road is really what it is. In fact, the Gaza road, if you ever go down it at first, it has trees and hills. And it's only until you get down to the very bottom into the Gaza Strip that it's more desert. But this road goes out, uh, out of Israel, and it was a trade route. It was, uh, it was mostly deserted by this time, but occasionally there were people on it. And so this angel says, you've been up in Samaria. It's been great there. You've been preaching the gospel. People have been getting saved. People have been getting healed. How many people know that when the good things are happening, our tendency is just want to stay in that particular place, and that we're happy, we're content, we're comfortable. But God had another assignment for Philip. And this time it wasn't crowds. This time it was for a person. Now, Philip didn't know that at the time because the angel doesn't tell him. All the angel says to him is go. Go south. He doesn't tell him who he's going to see. He doesn't tell him what he's going to do. He just says go south and start walking down that road. See, oftentimes when it comes to our lives, we want all the answers from God ahead of time, don't we? You know, tell me the when and the where and the who and the what. And, and, and so a lot of us, it's like, I don't feel like I've got enough information here, God, to take a step. And what I, what I just want you to see is that the angel, all the angel says is go. And so he goes. In fact, we'll see it again in verse 29. The Holy Spirit will say, go. And when it just comes to evangelism, personally, the operative word is it's go. Come on, everybody say it again. Go. It's go. Jesus said it in Matthew 28. He said, go. Let me ask you a question. Where's all my detail-oriented people in the room? The people that love all the details. Come on. Wave them in the air. You got your checklists. You know what's happening for the next week coming up. The planners. You, here's what you need. You need all the boxes checked. Well, guess what? God doesn't always do that, does he? I mean, details and facts are great. So great, in fact, that if I can just have the entire plan, you know what you have no need for? Faith. But so much of the Christian life, I'm sorry, detail people. It's go. And as we go, we get more info. And as we go, we get more opportunity. And as we go, we, God opens more doors. But oh, it's that initial going that's so hard for us, isn't it? This week, what I'm just believing is that God's going to speak to your heart and the Holy Spirit is going to say go. And, and in that moment, guess what you're going to have? In that moment, you're going to have a choice. <laughs> will you go without knowing or will you wait because you just need more information? And, and I, I just want to suggest that if the operative word of evangelism was, was go, well, let me say it this way. If the operative word was stay, then, then that's what he'd say. He'd say, hey, let's just get people saved in the church. Just stay. Just stay where you're at. But the only time that Jesus, that I can see, says to people to stay is the disciples at the very beginning when he tells them to stay in the upper, in the, uh, upper room while they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come. It's the only time he says stay. You need to stay. You need to stay and wait. The rest of the time, it's go. And sometimes, if I can just say it this way, sometimes we're so addicted to church that we've become immune to caring about anybody outside of the church. So we want revival to happen, but we just want to stay. We want revival to happen, but we just want to sit. We want revival to happen, but we just like more details before you can make it happen, maybe God. But if revival is really going to happen in the DFW Metroplex, then a lot of people are not going to get saved in church. They're going to get saved outside of church. Come on, it's quiet this morning. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And so we need, to, we need to move past that. We also got to move past this idea, well, it's the Bible Belt. Well, it's the Bible Belt, Pastor Dusty. There's a church on every corner. Everybody's saved in Dallas. Oh, really? Come on, in your, in your workplace, everybody's saved? 
How about that public school that your kids go to? All those kids just loving Jesus? I was in Grapevine Mills Mall looking for some shoes for my daughter yesterday. Like, I just walked to that mall. I could, already, I could just tell not very many people saved in this mall. <laughs> what about your neighborhood? That, that's why you and I got to hear the call of the Spirit of God saying, go to us. Follow the Lord when he says, go. Go to people. Go and share the gospel. Acts 8 tells me that, that even in the middle of nowhere, even in the middle of a deserted road, there are people who need to hear about Jesus. The problem, of course, in our American culture and this information world is that we've grown immune to it. We don't see the needs of people. We don't see the plight, the conditions that people are in. We're not aware, oftentimes, of how many people are suffering. But look, some of you right now, if you're just honest today, I mean, we, we were praying for needs uh, this past Tuesday night. People are pouring out. People are facing trouble in their life, and they have Jesus. Can you imagine the trouble you face in this life without Jesus? Sometimes people will go through a loss in our church. They'll, someone will pass, or they'll walk through a difficult place in their life. Maybe it's after the funeral or after the situation. I've heard this so many times. Pastor Mike, yeah, but we... I don't know how people go through this kind of stuff without a church. I don't know either. I don't know. But there's many people that are. There's many people that are facing hopelessness and despair and difficulty. And they need somebody to tell them about Jesus. That's why John 4, Jesus says this. Do you not say four months more and then the harvest? I tell you, come on, say this with me out loud, everybody. Open your eyes. (laughs) You gotta open your eyes. You gotta see what's going on around you. You gotta look to the fields. The fields are ripe for a harvest. So evangelism was never meant to be limited to the church. I'm thankful when it happens in the church, but I feel the responsibility. I've gotta prepare you to do this outside the church. And if he's moving in your life on Sunday, If he's restoring your life on Sunday, if he's blessing your life on Sunday, if he's moving on Sunday, then it's because Monday you have a job as a believer of Jesus. God, just help me right now. Stir some strategy in me. Help me see the importance of this. This is my high calling. And by the way, I want to say this. There are those of you that are already doing this. You know that you're, you're responding to the call of God whenever he says go to you in your life. I'm grateful for it. There's others of us today. We've got to get stirred to what God wants to do. The second thing I just want you to observe. Pause. The second thing I want you to observe is this. Evangelism. Evangelism was almost always initiated by the Christian. Technology is great until it don't work. (laughs) Evangelism, though, was almost always initiated by the Christian. Now, we can find a few examples in the Bible where it wasn't. You know, at one point in Acts 16, we'll get to that someday. But uh, (laughs) the jailer says to Paul, I believe, what must I do to be saved? People know that was like the easiest moment for Paul ever. It's like a fish jumped into the boat, you know, served up on a silver platter. You know, we'll get to those kind of moments. And that happens sometimes, but it's not normally the case. Most of the time, it's up to you and me to get to know people, to reach out to people, to make ourselves available to people. I want to, want to show you this in the scripture. It just says this in Acts 28. So the angel says to him, go, and I just want you to see the very first part. So he started out. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Like sometimes the simplest things can preach it. So he started out. He starts out, he doesn't know where he's going, he doesn't know what's going to happen, he's really not for sure about anything, but he just starts out. The rest of scripture says this, so he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kendake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. Now, I want to explain this a little bit to you, okay? Just like the ruler of Egypt would be called a pharaoh or the Roman emperor would be called Caesar, Kandanke was the title of the Egyptian ruler. And so he was, what we learn here is that he was in charge of all the treasury 
Uh, and so this is a very high-ranking official. And I want you to notice that it says that he had gone to worship. So one of the things you got to know, it's believed that the Ethiopians had long-time relations with Israel and with Israel's God. So this man is not a Christian. He, he is a Gentile. But at least on some level, he's involved with Jews. At least on some level, he's learning the Old Testament law. He's learning about the God of Israel. The Bible says this, that this man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah, the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. So this man is sitting in his chariot. He's reading the book of, or he's, yeah, reading the book of Isaiah. And Philip sees him at, sees this official. Now, you got to know, he doesn't know him. He has no idea that he has been in Israel, that he's been worshiping. More than that, he doesn't even know if the man can even speak his language. I mean, for all he knows, maybe he's just there on business. And the Holy Spirit says to Philip, go. There it is again. Go to his chariot. I think it's 12 times in the book of Acts that the Holy Spirit says to someone, go. If you want to know what God is saying to believers, look, he's saying a lot of things. But one of the things he's saying the most is go, go, go. Go. To unbelievers, let me tell you, he's saying something different. If you're an unbeliever here, guess what he's saying to you? He's saying, come. Revelation 21, Revelation 22, the spirit and the bride, which is the church. So the spirit of God and the church say to you, come. That's our invitation to unbelievers. Come. Come to Jesus. But what he's saying to Philip is go. And Philip has every reason not to go. I mean, aside from the language barrier, he's a commoner. This is a royal official. He's a Jew. This man's an Ethiopian. And Philip, if you can just get this in your mind, runs up to his chariot. Chariot's kind of walking. A little room here. So you're, hey, what's up, man? You good? And he just starts initiating the conversation. What you reading, man? So, We have to be willing to obey the Holy Spirit when he says go. But then once we go, there's a few steps that we have to learn about evangelism. I want to give them to you for just a second. But the first thing that you have to do is you have to to build a bridge with people that you meet. Acts 30 says this, Then Philip ran up to the chariot. He heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked him this question, Do you understand what you're reading? So in other words, look at this. Philip had to make the effort to get close. Effort went into this. Can I be honest with you? Part of the reason that some Christians really don't know anybody that's not a Christian is because they're unwilling to get close. In fact, can we just be honest up in this church today? There's a lot of Christians that are just really unfriendly. They don't want to make any effort. I just kind of stay to myself. Don't talk to me on this airplane. I'm going to put my headphones on. And honestly, some Christians, like, they may be saved, but they're mean. (laughs) Come on, am I being real today? Some of them are kind of snotty. Not everyone, but a lot of them are. If you're going to build a bridge, it's going to require some effort. I mean, he had to run up there. He has to keep up with the chariot. I mean, it'll take effort on your part. It takes intentionality on your part. It takes strategy on your part. How can I get close to them? How how can I share with them? How can I become their friend without them thinking that I'm some sort of a creeper? How can I get in relationship with them so I have the potential to begin to strike up conversation with them? Let's just say this. if If you don't get close to your neighbor... You can't share Christ with your neighbor. If you see someone but you never make an effort, nothing's ever going to happen. What, are you expecting them just one day to walk around and go, oh, you, are you a Christian? Please tell me about God. Please share him with me. No. And notice, too, that, that it says that when he got close, it says that he asks a question. So that means he starts listening. We have to be willing to listen to people around us. People don't know how much you know until they know how much you care. And the way that people know if we care is if we're willing to ask great questions and listen 
to them. Listen to what's going on in their life. Listen to what they're up against. Listen to the obstacles that they're facing. We got to be willing to learn how to be listeners. But the problem with a lot of Christians is, come on, they know everything. So you're snotty, you're mean, you're unfriendly, and then you know everything. Boy, I want to go to your barbecue. At some point, we got to be willing to say, no, 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 this is not about me. It's about you. I want to learn about you. But then at some point, at some point, you must steer the person to spiritual issues. So at some point, you become a great listener. You get to know people. But at some point, you start steering the conversation. That's why in Acts 30, it says this. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading the book about Isaiah the prophet. said, do you understand what you're reading? All he does is simply ask the question. He opens the door. A, a, a great way to start a conversation is just to ask a great question. A great way to witness is to ask great questions. And if you listen long enough to see a need, maybe a great question that you could see is once you know the need is, would you mind if I prayed with you about that? I mean, I'm telling you, I've been in restaurants. I've been on vacations. Normally, if I'm just honest with you, I look, it happens at least one time I feel like every vacation. I look, I'm, I'm sitting there, Kendra's over in the pool, and she has found a woman, and she is praying. And the woman just. <laughs> now, sometimes those women have been drinking, but it doesn't matter. Kendra's, Kendra's got them. She's witnessing to them. She's sharing the gospel. <laughs> but Kendra will love them. We were in an Uber a while back. It's just amazing to me all the different opportunities. We're in an Uber. Kendra and I are driving. We're in Colorado going to uh, a ministry event. I asked the Uber driver as we're driving, tell me about your life. Tell me about your family. We start, we start talking. How many people know you can get into an Uber and just kind of sit back and not talk to them and make it all about you? But I sat in the front seat because Kendra was holding my golf clubs. And... Um, <laughs> In the back. And I'm just like, tell me about your family. Tell me about your life. And we start talking. So naturally, as we start talking, he asks me, what do you do? And I say, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pastor. I pastor a church in Dallas. He goes, well, since you're a pastor, I'm thinking, oh, here we go. <laughs> he says, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. He said, I have a daughter, and we're, we're having a lot of trouble in our relationship right now. She's estranged. She lives on her own. She's got two kids. So where do you feel like the relationship broke down? She said in 2020 in the, in the political climate. He said, I believed one way, she believed another way. As we began to talk, we couldn't find common ground. It started to create issues and tension. We've never been the same since. How many people know that's heavy? In the middle of an Uber. So we just start talking. You know, I share some things with him about how to build relationship with his daughter again. It's this great conversation. At the end of it, this is what he says. He goes, this was the Uber ride that I didn't know I needed today. How many people know that like, that's how God can work in people's life? Here's a great question to ask people. Let me give you this. What can I pray for you about that if it happened, it would speak to your heart that there was a God who cared personally enough about you to do something about your need? a great question. Why why should you be willing to have faith to ask questions like that? Because the power of the living God is working on the inside of you. And then at some point, listen, at some point you have to be ready to give a clear presentation. You've got to be willing to talk about the Bible. I mean, Acts 31, this is what the man responded with. How can I? Remember Philip asks him, do you know what you're reading? He says, how can I? Unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And what's so cool is that Philip just starts right there. He starts talking about the book of Isaiah. He's explaining the verses that the man is looking at. He shows him how all the things that that happened in Isaiah are fulfilled in Jesus. Then Isaiah, that he's the suffering servant and that Jesus becomes the suffering servant who lays down his life. Now listen, you don't need to be a Bible scholar 
okay? You just have to be able to tell people what the gospel is. This is one of the things that I am working with my nearly 13-year-old daughter in. She's got to understand what the gospel is. Jaden, what's the gospel? She was here right now. She would tell you it's the good news. Gospel means good news. And it's really just three things. Number one, there's a God that loves you. Number two, there's a God that loves you so much that he sent his son to die that you would be forgiven and have relationship with him. And that number three, he didn't just die, but he defeated death. He was raised from the dead. And because of that, he's able to offer new life to us if we repent and invite him to be the Lord of our life. You say, well, Pastor Rusty, what if they don't know anything about the Bible? Then let me just tell you where you start. You just start with what you know. You just start with what they know, and you just start with what you know. You bring God. Here, here's, what, here's what I've realized uh, the, the whole, my whole life when it comes to God. This is what I've realized. If I'm willing to bring God my little, he will use my little for something big. That is the whole story of my life. Most of the people in my life that I led to Christ when I was my teenage years and my 20s, I felt completely over my head. I don't know if what I'm saying is right. I don't know if this is good. I don't know. But God's always used me right where I'm at. And, and he'll use you too. Reminds me of this amazing story about this 14-year-old girl that went to this Buddhist priest. I want to read this to you really quickly. It says, a young Buddhist priest that was studying to become a priest at the age of 17 was diagnosed with TB. It was a deadly disease with no cure, no treatment, given three to six months to live. He prayed to Buddha to help him, but it only got worse. Desperate, he cried out, Buddha, I don't know where you are. If there were a God in the universe, would you come instead of Buddha? Soon after, a, a girl in high school uniform came to his home unexpectedly. Is anyone home, she asked. Who is it, the man replied. She said, hi, you're a student also. You look sick. Do you want me to help you? Then she told him that she wanted to tell him about the most important person in the world. She told him about Jesus, crucified for his sin, curses, disease, risen from the dead in power. She pleaded with him to receive Jesus, but he rejected her story as a lie and screamed at her to leave and never return. The next day, the girl returned and she told him and pray, that she had prayed for him and began to cry, even though she didn't know him well. The man tells the story that she came every day for a week, even though he lashed out in anger at her every time. Hey, I don't want to listen to what you're saying. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't need Jesus. And I don't need you to keep telling me what to believe. Don't come back here again. She left him a Bible and she asked him to read it and he spent the next days devouring it. He would say years later, the Bible was so different. The Bible was talking about one person, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Buddhist religion is very logical, profound, and philosophical. But the Bible was so pragmatic and, pra and practical. And I needed a practical God because I was dying. Several days later, the man kneeled and came to Jesus. He said that he didn't know how to pray, so he prayed to Mr. Jesus. Mr. Jesus, if you are the Son of God... Prove it to me. I'm a young man. I'm 17 years old. I'm too young to die. You would get tremendous benefit out of me if you ever healed me. That was the prayer he prayed. Six months later, the Lord healed him completely from terminal TB. He would go on to tell the world about Jesus. That man was a man named Dr. David Cho. He was the late pastor of Full Gospel Church in South Korea the largest Pentecostal church in the world with, get this, over 750,000 members. That little girl, that teenage girl, when she was going to the door of this man, knocking on doors, trying to preach Jesus to people, she could have never known the heavenly return that was going to come because of her willingness to go. Listen, you and I don't know. We, we, we don't know what, what God has for the people that he's sending to us. Who would have thought that this man studying to be a Buddhist priest, dying of TB, would later become a Christian leader? But that's why I love the gospel. 
The gospel opens our eyes to, to, to the one thing that we can never truly know without Jesus, and that is the wonderful purpose by which he's created us. I, I want to say this to every person here in this room. You are not here accidentally. You are here in God's purpose. Ephesians, the book of Ephesians says this. says, he created us in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared for us in advance. Do you hear that? He created works for you to do. But it's only when you give your heart to Jesus. Oh, it unlocks all of the gifts. It unlocks all of the opportunity in your life. Listen, that's what evangelism about. Evangelism is about. It's about unlocking people to the truth of the love of God and the purpose that he has for their lives. But it's up to us. Uh, evangelism has to be initiated by the Christian. Do not wait. Go and tell, Jesus said, the good news. Here's the last thing today, and I'm getting ready to wrap this up. But I think this is really powerful. And it's this, that the third principle that you need to learn from the book of Acts is that God has already been working before evangelism ever begins. Look, anytime we're in church and someone decides to lift their hand, to make a decision, to make Jesus the Lord of their life after hearing a message like today, make sure you know this, it never has anything to do with me. Never. Now, does God use me? Of course he does. But long before I've ever come into the picture of talking like I am right now and people hearing, God has already been at work in that person's life. There, there have been people that accepted Christ in this church. And you'd never know this, but a mom had been praying for years. A friend had been praying for years. A family member had been standing in the gap, agreeing for them and for their life. I mean, I've talked to enough people to know that you just don't suddenly just one day just arrive. What you do is you get to that point and then you look back and you see all these little things that have been adding up. Man, this happened and this happened to get me to this moment, to bring me to this point through conversations with others, through the situations that have happened in my life, through, through my own prayers, through, through the prayers of others. Every time, it's because people, every person in this room is on a spiritual journey right now. And so before I ever talk to anybody about Jesus, you have to know that God has already been there. He's already been working. He's already been preparing the heart. I mean, that's what happened with the Ethiopian man. He's traveled all the way back to Jerusalem, at least 600 miles. He's a eunuch. Why is that important? It's important for this reason. You have to understand that if he's a eunuch, that means that he's castrated, which means that his ability uh, to, the reason they would castrate these eunuchs is to, to basically forego or to get rid of the temptation for them to leave their own legacy. Instead, because they can't have their own legacy, they protect another legacy. But the reason it's so important is because when he went to the temple, because of Mosaic law, it limited what he could do in temple worship how close that he could get. He had to worship from a distance. But here's this man on this journey, and he's on this search, and he wants to know more about this God. And God calls a man named Philip to say, the distance that you had to stand in that temple has now been covered by Jesus on the cross so that you can now, instead of coming from a distance, can now come close. God's been working for days, weeks, months, years in the life of this man. And in the middle of his confusion about what he's reading, I love how God provided him someone to explain. Where do you get the confidence to start chasing after chariots? It's the power of the Holy Spirit that boldly comes in your life, changes you, fills you, and then calls you to go. Because he's gone before you already. Because he's already at work in that person's life. Guess what that means? That's this, this is why that's so important. Because it's not even up to you. It's not about how smart you are. 
It's not about all the things that you need to get figured out before you're qualified enough to share Jesus with them. It's not about how smooth you are or how capable you are. No, the Spirit of God is using you because the Spirit of God prepared you to do these good works through you in advance. And the Spirit of God has been interceding for them. It's a divine intersection that was meant to take place in the life of that person. And so Acts 36 says this, he receives Christ. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. I love this. The eunuch said, look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and he and Philip and the, both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Here it is, the book of Acts. People get saved, and then they get baptized right there. There's no waiting. There's no reason to delay. He's baptized. And I hope that you, if you've never had a meaningful baptism decision, I want you to get baptized too. Right on the heels of Seek Week, man. It would be the most incredible thing. Go out to the lobby today. Talk to our team about setting up a baptism. We'd love to do it with you. I want to close today, but as we close, two things. Number one, if you're a follower of Jesus today, (laughs) I hope that you're ready. Because we don't come to church simply to be hearers of the word of God. We come to church to learn how to become doers of the word of God. So whenever we hear the Bible being preached, we should listen to the Holy Spirit. We should step out to obey. And we should then apply that word to our life. God, how do I, how do I apply this? So you should just, listen, you should just expect that the Spirit of God is going to say to you, go. You should just expect that that those parents on your kid's team, those people in your workplace, those neighbors that are right down the street from you, that you should just expect to start hearing the Holy Spirit saying to you, go. And when he says, don't be like, no. Go. Because in that moment, everything you hear today is going to be put to the test. And my question is, will you be willing to say, I I, I don't know how this is going to go, but I do know the Spirit of God. And I trust the Spirit of God in me. And I trust that the Spirit of God is telling me to go, so I'm going to go. If there's a Spirit telling you to share about Jesus, look, you you don't have to wonder. (laughs) Is that God? You don't have to wonder that. Is that God? I don't know if that's God telling me to do that. Guess who it's not? It's probably not the devil. The devil's probably not telling you to go share Jesus with somebody. So it's probably God because he cares about people. He's gonna send you. And how many people know this past week, man, we've asked God to fill us up this week. Why? Fill us up so that you can send us out. Our workplaces, the byways, the highways. I mean, imagine if every single person left this church service today, went out from beyond the four walls of this church and shared Christ with just one person. Every single person shared Christ with one person. The next week you brought somebody with you into God's, it'd be be life-changing. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. There's some of you, God's been working for a long time to bring you to this moment right here and right now. And you have never made Jesus the Lord of your life. You've you've never opened the door. The Bible says that he's knocking. He stands at the door of our heart and he knocks. He patiently waits. And and you've been putting it off. You'd say, well, some of you would say, well, I opened the door a long time ago. But if I'm honest with you, I really haven't been walking with him. How, How do you know, Dusty, that God's working in my life right now? Well, number one, you're here right now. God's grace is already at work. Why else would you be here? You're not a believer and you're here right now? You you think it's an accident? It's not. God wants you to hear this today and he wants you to respond. He wants you to open up your heart to him. He, He wants to show you purpose in your life so that you can respond to his word. So that so that you could see purpose like you've never imagined before. I mean, joy, peace, it's possible for you in your life. So I want you to bow your heads with me all over the room right now. 
message like this, I would be remiss. I'd, I'd miss an opportunity. You've heard about Jesus. Hopefully you've experienced Jesus today and now you have the opportunity to respond to Jesus. If there's never been a moment in your life, a meaningful moment where you'd say, I, I made Jesus Lord, I surrendered my life to him, put him on the throne of my heart. If I asked you today, kind of an old school question, but where would you go if you died today? Would you spend eternity with, with Jesus in heaven? You don't know the answer to that question? Then man, this is an opportunity for you to respond. I think a moment like this, it's really not about me, it's not about anyone else. In fact, I think it's really a personal moment between you and God. But if you would just be so, be so bold today to say, man, I just, I wanna invite Christ to sit on the throne of my heart right now in this moment. Then with nobody looking around, would you just on the count of three, just shoot your hand really high so I know who I'm praying for today. Come on, let Christ be the Lord of your life. If that's you, lift it high today, boldly, without hesitation, on the count of three, one, two, three. Come on, just say, that's me. I need to make him Lord today. Hands going up today, saying yes to Jesus. I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. You're saying yes to Jesus all over this room. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, this is my moment to make Jesus Lord. I'm doing it right now because I need Jesus to sit on the throne of my heart. I need to put him in the place he's always wanted to be. Hands going up today saying yes to Jesus. Make just another moment more. Yeah, I'm boldly saying it today. All right, you can put your hands down today. Now listen to me. God doesn't care how fancy you sound. He just cares that it comes from your heart. Would you do this right now? I mean, this is a holy moment. Everybody in this room praying for these people because God loves when people come into his kingdom. Say, Jesus, right now, make, I make you the Lord of my life. I repent. I believe that you died for me. I believe you gave your life for me. And so today I want to give my life back to you. I want to thank you for the gift of salvation that you're offering me today. It's a gift of grace that I so am thankful to receive. Thank you, Lord, that everything in my life, as I'm looking back, it's been leading up to this moment right now. It's a culmination. It's a moment where you're moving and you've been working to bring me to a place where I can have a relationship with you. Jesus, thank you that you love me so much that you would go through those things and do that for me today. Lord, help my life to never be the same. I surrender to you. Father, I pray for every person who's raised their hands, every person that's walked into this room today and needs the hope of Jesus. Would you meet them? Let the Holy Spirit speak to them right now. And then for every person in our church right now, Lord, as they walk around their lives this week, Lord, remind them, speak to them. As you say go, let them be obedient to the voice of the Holy Spirit. We love you, God. We thank you for it right now. Help us be the answer. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, and you clap your hands and thank God for all those people that just lifted their hands. Would you stand on your feet today, church, all over the room? Well, come on, church. Can we say thank you to Pastor Dusty for that incredible word? We love you, man. Thank you for challenging us today, PD. And well, hey, listen, if you gave your life to Jesus for the very first time today, can I say welcome to the family of God? It is the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. Come on, church, let's celebrate with them today. And listen, if that was you, we want to help you take your next step. And so, out in the lobby, right there in the center is our Guest Central Next Steps table, our connections team, and they wanna help put resources in your hand, okay? What's next for you? Our team wants to help you with that. Maybe you don't have a Bible. We'd love to get you a Bible, all right, everybody? And so please go to our connections table right there in the center of the lobby. Let them know that you gave your life to Jesus for the very first time, and they will help you with your next steps. All right, everybody, and listen, like Pastor Dusty said, in the book of Acts, when someone got saved, boom, they turned around and they got baptized, all right? So let's do that as well. And so if you've never had a meaningful baptism experience, please, please, please go out to the lobby, talk to our team, and we'll get that set up for you guys, all right? Well, hey, if you'd like to give to the mission and vision of HC, you can do so. Uh, the different ways are behind me on the screen. And listen, let me pray for you, and then we'll be dismissed, okay? Heavenly Father, we love you so much, God. Help us 
to be evangelists in our city. Help us to reach our community, Lord God. You've already given us every gift and ability that we need. And so we just ask, Holy Spirit, would you come alive on the inside of us and help us reach our community and invite them to church and help lives be transformed and saved. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen and amen. We love you, church. And we'll see you guys at our prayer meeting this Wednesday night. Goodness is running after, it's running after.